This is KGW News at 11. Hey, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for staying up late with us. I'm Galen Etlin. Less than a month into the new year, Portland's rising gun violence has not quit. More and more neighbors are angry. More and more families are grieving. So now police are putting more officers on the streets this weekend. KGW's Art Edwards joins us now in the newsroom with what this new effort will look like. Well, Galen, for the first time, it's going to be a combination of resources from two programs within the Portland Police Bureau, but it's not going to be a permanent solution. The problem is not going away. Uh, gun violence is, uh, well, I would say, the biggest public safety issue that we have here in the city of Portland right now. As of Saturday afternoon, Portland police say they have responded to 92 shootings so far this year. More than two dozen people have been injured, and seven have died as a result of gun violence. That includes a man who was shot and killed early Friday morning in Old Town. The numbers are, are, are staggering. Um, they are disappointing. Um, but, you know, they're also not entirely unexpected because we knew that um, this was kind of where we were going over the course of most of last year. As a result of the shootings over the last few days, police are putting more resources in the street. Some of them from the newly established focused intervention team and some from the enhanced community safety team. For the first time, we're combining these two teams together uh, in an effort to have high visibility patrol as well as response to shootings. The officers are working overtime this weekend, so the added resources are not here for the long term. It's not something we can sustain. Uh, our staffing issues are well known. Um, you know, we've been very open with our community about our limitations right now because of our staffing. Uh, that's going to continue. Raymond Lusk has lived in the Cully neighborhood in northeast Portland for the last four years. Just a few nights ago, the gun violence came within blocks of his home. We heard some uh, what sounded like gunshots, and uh, we didn't really know what was going on. We heard sirens a little later, and then later on we learned that uh, there had been a uh, shooting at the 7-Eleven, and a, a couple dozen casings were recovered. No one was injured, but police recovered this gun not far from the shooting and made an arrest in the case. These kind of incidents spark a strong emotion. Fear, I mean... Um, Stray bullets come through houses and kill people, and we've had a lot of uh, buildings that are shot up in this town, and um, it appears to be getting worse every, every month. Now, Lusk says that he wants to see some long-term plans to deal with the gun violence in the city of Portland, and he believes those plans need to come from city leaders. Art Edwards reporting live in the newsroom for us. Thank you so much, Art. Now, while Portland police work to prevent more shootings, U.S. Representative from Washington Jamie Herrera Butler is introducing a new law to help smaller police departments. The Invest to Protect Act would provide federal money for training, body cameras, mental health resources, and recruitment and retention. The program is designed to help police departments like the one in Kelso, which has 28 sworn officer positions, but only 23 are filled. There are a lot of um, small forces across the nation that just don't have the resources to really to bring them, you know, up to a 21st century level, whether it's technology and data or training or recruitment and retention. And this money is going to help them get there. The Kelso Police Department is trying to modernize by implementing a body camera program for officers. The chief says it will help improve relations and money is needed to make it happen in a smaller force. Herrero Butler is now looking for co-sponsors, so it may be a little while before this bill is taken up by the full house. This coming week, Portland Police Chief Chuck Lavelle will present a report to the City Council. It will be about the Bureau's relationship with the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Joint Terrorist Task Force. The annual report is a requirement from a 2019 City Council resolution. That details the frequency of requested assignments and referrals between those agencies. The report was set for Wednesday this past week, but was then delayed until this upcoming Tuesday. Earlier this week, though, several organizations, including the ACLU, hosted a forum to share concerns about PPB's involvement with the Joint Task Force. Portland police officers working as GTT officers may be engaged in actions that are in direct conflict with this law. The most direct way to prevent civil rights abuses and potential state law violations is for the city to prohibit Portland Police Bureau officers from participating with the JTTF. However, to the extent that the Bureau continues to have engagement with the JTTF, it is critical for the city to create meaningful oversight and transparency. 
So let's break this down a little bit. A quick rundown of the information of what will be submitted next week. The FBI special agent in charge did not request PPB officers for criminal investigations in 2021. They did refer one case to Portland police that was involving a 14 year old making bomb threats to a school that ended up not being credible, though. Portland police referred seven cases to the FBI. We are following a developing investigation now. Two people are dead from a plane crash in Salem this afternoon. Police and fire crews responded to the airport around 3 o'clock. A small plane crashed near the end of a runway, and witnesses said that plane was trying to land when it crashed. Both people on board died at the scene. The FAA and NTSB are investigating exactly what happened. We'll be sure to let you know. Well, 2021 ended with more than 100,000 job openings in Oregon, and tonight we are getting an inside look at the challenge to hire workers these days during the Great Resignation. Papa Murphy's is a chain based in Vancouver. It has 1300 stores with 55 in the Portland, Vancouver area. Those have about 100 job openings right now. So a lot of our stores in the market have seen reduced hours because they don't have people that are willing to come in and work the really busy shift. The biggest constraint in the economy right now is labor. It's harder to find workers today than it was, you know, two, three years ago. A big part of that is trying to make the jobs appealing too, right? So some Papa Murphy's franchises are offering hiring and referral bonuses to get people to apply. Portland has a lot of taxes. If you live here, you know that. And there are some new ones you need to know about this year. Most of them will affect people, though, making higher incomes. The Metro now has a supportive housing services tax, which includes Multnomah, Washington and Clackamas counties. And Multnomah County has another tax, a preschool for all income tax. So you could be paying one or both, depending on where you live. Both taxes apply to people making more than $125,000 a year or $200,000 if you file jointly. The City of Portland's Division of Revenue calculates what you owe and then people can download forms or pay online. We're online. Whether you live in Clackamas, Washington County, wherever, that City of Portland website is the resource for everyone affected by either the Metro tax or the Multnomah County tax. Now we know it's a lot to remember and figure out, so we've broken everything down on KGW.com for you. That also explains how employers will withhold the tax in the future. And now we turn to mask mandates. Some students in Oregon want to end it. Some Sayusla High School students in Florence are sending demands to the district's school board. The district may join a small number of others around the state requiring student athletes to wear masks while competing. Now, some students don't really care. Others are pushing back. My mask gets all wet. I'm breathing that in and that is unsafe for me. It's everyone's choice to do what they feel and deem is necessary, but I am all for keeping children and everyone else safe. And to clarify, even if you are breathing harder, the masks are still safe for your health. Now, for now, the board ultimately decided against requiring masks for students during sports. It also voted against keeping students on campus for lunch and approved a change in bell schedule to free up staff time to contact absent students.